phone sessions. But Juan has explained ECG in a very great way, and this is going to make our life much more easier, especially when we talk about the access and about interpreting the ECG in this second session. So bear with me. So we'll talk about the second part of ECG. My name is Rodwan, and I'm a medical intern. So this is the ECG paper that has Safwan, Safwan has explained its physiology in details. And, uh, and basically, there are two questions that arises when we look at this ECG. Number one, uh, who has put these numbers? So actually, just to give you an idea, uh, these numbers are actually, you can think about them that they are not put by anyone. They are actually, it's just a machine that is recording real life changes in real time. So you can think of the ECG machine as a paper and then a pen, okay, that whatever electricity it receives, then it just goes and draws this electricity. So if it's not hooked up to any patient, then it's just draw, it's just draw the isoelectric line. And then once it's hooked up to the patient, it's, it will just start showing the changes that are happening at the patient's heart right now. And it records the progress at a speed of 25 millimeter per second, then you need to memorize that number. It will come as an MCQ. So it, it, it kind of draws five major boxes or five big boxes in one second. And that's the speed of the ECG machine. And so if you do the math and if you interpret this number, then you will end up with these small numbers, okay, which are much better visualized here. So every small box in the ECG paper is 0 0.04 millisecond, which is almost nothing. Okay, and that's why we prefer to talk about the big boxes because now that will make a little bit more sense because every five small boxes will give a 0 0.2 second, which is one over five of a single second. Okay, and that's basically the time axis. Now the vertical axis is the electricity axis or the voltage that throws the ECG lines. Okay, and that's not as important as the time, but for your sake of information, one small box is 0 0.1 millivolt. So a big box is 0 0.5 millivolt because it contains five small boxes. And then a large, uh, two large boxes are actually one millivolt. Okay, now the second question, why is ECG paper standardized? And that's because someone who is expert in cardiology should read an ECG that is printed out in Germany uh, in the same way that is that he reads an ECG that is printed out in the US. So that's a very like it makes a lot of sense, right? You cannot have like different rules for these small and large boxes. You need to have everything standardized. Memorizing these numbers will actually make your life much easier. Uh, because you you know when you calculate the heart rate and the axis and so on, you don't really need to go back. Okay, what was the small box and what was the large box? So I I suggest that you spend time memorizing these numbers. All right. So the ultimate session of the, the ultimate goal of this session is that uh, okay, ECG is a very broad topic. Okay, it doesn't end. It's literally an endless topic. You continue learning more about ECG in year three, in year five, in internship, and even in residency and in your cardiology fellowship if you become a cardiologist. So uh, you need to set your limit of what you need to know for first year. And it's actually two things. Number one, how to read the ECG appropriately, okay? And uh, you know, to have uh, a standardized approach in, in whenever you are shown an ECG. So you follow simple steps to read the ECG. And number two, uh, you need to just recognize some basic pathologies on the ECG that we will talk about later in this session. So by the end of this session, we'll be able to do all of these. So we'll look at the ECG, we'll determine the heart rate, the rhythm, the conduction, regularity, every interval, and Safwan has already spent time about that. And then we'll talk about the axis, we'll touch a bit on the hypertrophy and other ischemia related changes, okay? So, so we'll start by calculating the heart rate. So whenever we're shown an ECG, that's the first thing that you're done. Now, when a consultant or any doctor shows you an ECG paper, never just go and say, this is a sinus rhythm. Okay, they'll, they'll be upset actually. They'll like, they'll like that you start saying, okay, so we'll first start by talking about the heart rate and then the rhythm and then the regularity. So they like actually hearing these things. Okay, if you just go and then say, what is the diagnosis or what is the rhythm, just the sign of rhythm, they'll actually not like it and they'll not give you the full mark. Okay, so that's why we learn these basic steps. But then when you become an expert, it just becomes like, uh, you know, in a matter of seconds, you can read an ECG. So when we calculate the heart rate, there are two ways. There is the accurate way and there is the practical way. Okay, so the accurate way is that, okay, we know what a small, so we need to calculate, okay, how many times the heart beat per, uh, per minute, right? And um, so we, we know what is the time that it takes for the ECG to pass one small box, which is 0 0.04 seconds. 
So we say, okay, how long does the heart take to beat one, uh, one single beat, which is from the R interval to the R interval? And that's the most accurate way. You can take from the P to the P, but that's not accurate because the P wave can change it. A beating of the heart is actually the contraction of the ventricles, which is represented by the R to R interval. Okay, so the R, okay, so we can calculate the number of small boxes. Okay, so we know that each huge, each big box is five small boxes. So we have five, 10, 15, and 20 small boxes. And we know that each one is 0 0.04 second. And if we do the math, we'll get that the single, single heartbeat is going to take 0 0.8 seconds. So that's less than a second, okay, for the heart to beat one time. Now we'll say that they have a 60 second in one minute. And so if we, if we divide 60 seconds by the time it takes for a single beat to happen, then we'll get the average heart rate, which is 75 beat per minute. Okay, I think this is so easy. And that's actually the accurate way because you are actually taking account every single small box, okay, in order to calculate an accurate heart rate. Okay, now the second way, uh, the second way of uh, calculating the heart rate on an ECG is actually what I call the practical way because that's what we usually do when we are in patient's room or we want a very quick, you know, estimation of the heart rate. So we basically take an R interval that is clearly found on one of the uh, one of the broad lines, okay, these clear red lines. So this R interval is perfect here. For example, this one, if you see, it's not perfectly on the red line. So I wouldn't take it. I would take this one because it's much more perfect, okay? And then we need to calculate how many big boxes, okay, is between one R and the second R interval. So uh, this is the first R wave, okay? So that's one big box, two big box, three, and then four big boxes, okay? And then we take that number and we divide it by 300. Now, why 300? Because you need to do the math and calculate the small boxes and you know the, the, the milliseconds and so on, but you will end up with 300. So that's a standard number, okay? Just memorize it. So you divide 300 by four big boxes and you'll end up with 75, which is the same number that we got here, okay? So if you said, if you found that the RR interval is, let's say 4.5 boxes, then you divide 300 by 4.5. So that method is a bit less accurate because it doesn't take into account the very small boxes, but it gives you a very good estimation. So in exam, if you are shown an ECG and you are, allowed, you are asked to calculate the heart rate, then use this method. While in, in practical life and in hospitals, if you want to calculate the heart rate, then you can use this method. Is everything clear right now? For one reason, I cannot see the chart. I don't know why. Okay. So I'm sorry, I just saw the chat or answered the questions. All right, so I have some questions here. So why it is 25 millimeter per second? So that's the speed at which the ECG line goes, okay? It's a standard speed, it's fixed number, okay? So every second, the ECG will draw 25 millimeter of lines, which is 25 uh, small boxes or five big boxes, okay? And then the second question that I got is why it is 60 seconds divided by this number and not the opposite, because we need to know how many of these of this event can happen in 60 seconds, okay? So that's basic math. You just divide the, the, the seconds that you have by how much time it takes for a single event to happen, and you end up with the number of beats per minute. Okay, so... So yeah, another question that I received, you know, what if the line is like in the middle of the small box? Literally, that would not make any, any difference, okay, clinically. So like if the heart rate is 86 or 87, that would not make any difference, right? So we usually only go by the by the small boxes. So we usually define ourselves, we, we multiply by the number of, of like a small box as a unit, okay? We don't go like it is 19.5 small box, okay? We don't do that actually. Okay, so let's move on to the intervals on the ECG. Juan has already explained them very well. So that's the second step, okay? So uh, when we talk about the methodology of ECG, so we calculate the heart rate, and then we actually need them to calculate the rhythms, but I kept it to the ends. And then after that, we calculate the intervals, okay? So we need just to make sure that all the ECG ECG intervals are actually within their standard limits and no one is actually exceeding its standard time because if that is the case, then a pathology is present. I will talk about some examples later in this slide. 
So we'll start, for example, with the PR interval. So a normal PR interval is between 0 0.12 second and 0 0.2 second, which is between three to five small box, uh, three to five small boxes, or three small boxes and one large box. Okay, uh, that's why I told you you need to memorize the numbers at the beginning very well because it can make your life a bit easier. Okay, so that's the PR interval. Now a pitfall here is that you need to make sure that you know that the PR interval is between the start of the P wave and the end of the R seg uh, and the and the and the and the beginning of the R wave. Okay, so that's the PR segment. Okay, so it doesn't end by the end of the P wave. It's not only this I, this line. It's the entire interval. Okay, from the starting of the P wave all the way to the R wave, and that's what we call the PR interval. It should be between three to five small boxes, or as I said, zero point one two to zero point two seconds. Okay. If it gets prolonged, then we'll talk about the condition, which we call it first degree type block, which is basically prolongation of the PR interval. Now, the second interval that we look about, or the second uh, part of the ECG, okay, is the QR complex, and it generally needs to be uh, less, uh, less than 0 0.1 second. Now, 0 0.12 second is almost three boxes, so a QRS should be a little bit less than three, uh, three small boxes, okay? If it was more than three box, three small boxes, then that's, we call it a wide QRX complex. And again, it indicates a lot of things, okay? It actually indicates that the QRX is generated from the ventricles, okay, and not from the AV node and from, it's not conducted from the S8 through the AV node through the normal conduction. You don't need to know that, but you need to know that a QRX that is more than three small boxes is actually pathological, okay? Or a wide QRX. And then the third thing is the QT interval. Okay, so a QT interval normally, so a QT interval, so first, what is the QT interval? It is between the Q wave, okay, and then the R, and then the S, and then the ST segments, and then till the end of T wave, and the, many people get tricked by this point, they think that the QT interval is up to this point, okay? No, the QT interval actually include the T wave, okay, and it's this entire thing. Normally, normally, it is around uh, 0 0.4 seconds. Okay, so 0 0.4 second is, is around 400 milliseconds, okay, which is around eight small boxes, oh, uh, sorry, uh, which is around uh, uh, 10 small boxes, okay, or two large boxes. So in summary, acuity interval should be less than two large boxes, okay, or 0 0.4 second or 400 millisecond. All of these expressions are equal to each other. And again, I have a slide about what happens if we have a long QT interval, and there are many syndromes and many diseases that can happen because of this prolongation of the QT interval. Okay, so we looked, so now, so far, what we did on the ECG paper is that we calculated the heart rate, and then we calculated the PR interval, the QR, which is between three and five small boxes, the QRS interval, which is less than three boxes, and then the QT interval, which is less than 0 0.4 second or two large boxes. Okay, so that's the second step, which is calculating the intervals and making sure that every interval is within its standard limits. Now, next we'll move on to the axis, and because I can't see the chat, so I'll take the question after I finish the axis of the heart, okay? So you can keep them at the end. Uh, so the axis of the heart is the summation of the electrical force of the heart. So the, the, the direction of electricity of the heart from where to where it is going. And again, I think Safwan has explained the, the physiology behind that. Uh, but to think about the axis, uh, we always actually think about many of the electric, many of the concept, the, phys the physics concept that apply to electricity actually applies to water. Okay, so you can think about the, uh, the direction of water flow or the direction of electricity flow within the heart as the axis of the heart. So to understand it more, um, let me start drawing here. Okay, so normally in any normal person, the direction of electricity of the heart will start from the SA node all the way to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the apex of the heart, okay? And that will create a direction of electricity from the upper right body, okay, to the lower left body, right? So it will be from that direction as the arrow shows, okay? Uh, I cannot clear this. Okay, never mind. Um, now, uh, how can this axis change? Just to, to, to get an understanding of what does an axis mean, okay, we'll talk about uh, situations in which the axis can actually go up or down. So this arrow will go either up or down. So the orientation of the heart, look at me at, the, look at me at this example. So this is a very rare disease, okay, which is called dextrocardia, and it is when the heart is flipped, okay? So, uh, the, so the, 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 the apex of the heart is actually in the opposite direction, okay? It's not normal, but it's in the opposite direction. So in that person, okay, which is, this is a very rare 
a condition but I'm just putting it here to explain the axis of the heart the uh, the flow of electricity is going to be in that way right because the heart will going to contract from the SA node all the way to the uh, to the apex of the heart and then the major directional force of electricity will be in that point okay so that's we call that an extreme axis deviation and we will see it uh, numerically how do we represent that on the on the lead circles okay so that's an example of how an axis electricity can change. And then another example is that axis can actually even tell us not only about the orientation of the heart, but about the size of ventricular chambers, okay? So uh, for example, let's say that someone has any disease, okay, I'm not gonna go into the details, and then the left ventricle has become really large, okay? So it's occupying a large area, okay, compared to the right ventricle. So now when the SA node fires, okay, the ratio of electricity that is going to the left ventricle is much higher than the ratio that is going to the right ventricle. And so the axis, instead of being like that, it's gonna shift upward, right? It's gonna shift like that because most of the electrical cells are actually being here. Okay, so the major, the major, the summation of forces of electricity is going to actually be a little bit up because most of the heart tissue is now right here, and most of the electricity is going place in this area. So that's, for example, how an axis can tell us about the size of ventricular chamber. So if we find someone with left axis deviation, again, we will explain more on that later, then we know that he might have a left ventricular hypertrophy. So his left ventricle is actually huge, and he has a lot of muscles in the left ventricle. Okay. And uh, similar to that, but on the opposite uh, on the opposite end, if someone has a large right ventricle, okay, then his uh, like this his large vent right ventricle is very large. Then this direction of force is going to be a little bit shifted down like that, okay, because most of the electrical tissue is in this area, and so again the summation of uh, the vector of electricity is going to be a little bit shifted uh, to that to that direction, okay. So we talked about that. And then now let's talk more about interpreting the axis more clinically. So a normal axis is between positive 90 and negative 30, okay? So that's between negative 30 is in this area and the positive 90 in that, and that's normal person, okay? In fact, some books says that the normal axis is between zero and 90, but again, uh, they even uh, they later added that even up to negative 30 is considered normal, okay? So some children, some tall people, whatever, if they have an axis size between negative 30 and positive 90, and we consider that normal. Okay, that's the normal finding. If I tell you that the axis of person is between negative 30 all the way up to positive 90. Now, a left axis deviation, so we said that a left axis deviation can happen when someone has a huge left ventricle, so we call that left ventricular hypertrophy. So this left axis deviation, actually, if it is happy, we call, we call it a left axis deviation if it's between negative 30 and negative 90. Okay, so that's the green area over here. Okay, so if someone's axis is actually in this area or in this green area, then we know that he might have a pathology, which most commonly is left ventricular hypertrophy. So a left ventricular hypertrophy, he means that he has a very huge left ventricle and the most common cause of left ventricular hypertrophy is actually hypertension because when you have hypertension you need a very strong ventricles to push the blood against the very high blood pressure okay so we might when we look at the ecg and we see left ventricular hypertrophy then we might say okay this person might have hypertension or there are multiple other diseases okay that could cause a left axis deviation as well now opposite to that okay or the other end is the right axis deviation which is between uh, positive 90 to positive 180. That's the blue area over here, okay? So now, uh, why would someone have uh, an electrical axis, okay, that is not in this pink area, but rather in this blue area? Well, as we said on the first slide, uh, because his heart might have a large right ventricle, right? So when you have a large right ventricle, then the electricity, instead of being like that, okay, it's gonna be a little bit shifted to the blue area, like this okay so a large right ventricle could be caused by a condition that we call instead of systemic hypertension we call it a pulmonary hypertension so the pulmonary vessels have high blood pressure and that caused the ventricular muscles the right ventricle muscles to become so big okay to push against this high blood pressure in the pulmonary arteries and uh, and then because of that, okay, the right ventricle gets really big, and that's what we call right ventricular hypertrophy, okay? Sometimes right axis deviation can be, again, normal in children and dolphin adults as well. And uh, finally, okay, so we talked about the normal person. We talked about left axis deviation and right axis deviation. And finally, 
what we call extreme axis deviation. Okay, so that's abnormal. Okay, you cannot have someone with an axis that is in opposite direction to the heart. Okay, so the heart, the heart electricity is flowing that way, and then you're saying that the electricity is flowing in the opposite direction. Okay, except in few conditions. Okay, which are dextrocardia that we talked about and COPD. So COPD is a condition of the lung. Okay, that changes the air spaces, and then it might change the position of the heart. The actual position of the heart might go a bit posterior, creating an axis deviation or a lateral STEMI. So a lateral STEMI, if we have, let's say this is the heart, okay, that's a very basic drawing, okay, and then you have a lateral STEMI, STEMI means an infarction, okay, or dead tissue in the lateral area of the heart. So if you have all of this area is dead, okay, because it has, because the, the blood was blocked and then we had the myocardial infarction and then all of this area is dead, Okay, then the entire, then this area is almost not contributing anything to the axis. So the entire axis of the heart will actually shift in that direction and it could reach a point that it creates an extreme axis deviation. Okay, so now we explain the concept of axis. We'll talk about how to calculate it, but first I'll see if we have any questions. So if I am going too fast, or if you want me to repeat anything, then this is a good time. Otherwise, I'll continue. All right, perfect, all clear. So now there are three ways of, determ of determining the, the electricity or the mean electrical axis of the heart or the MEA. The first two are pure physiological methods, okay? And I kept it to the very end because they are useless, literally. Okay, the third one is the one that you'll actually use in the hospital and in patient rooms because it's a very quick, and method. So we'll start with the third one, and then just for the sake of exams and for the sake of learning the physiology at its basics, we're gonna touch upon the first two points as well. Okay, so let's start with the third method, which is the one that everyone uses. Okay, it's this is it's a very easy method. So we said that the normal axis of the heart is between negative 30 and 90. So it is between lead ABL, okay. Uh, sorry, that, just a second. Okay, so no, actually for this method, some people take ABL, but for to, to be more accurate for majority of normal people, okay, the, the normal axis of the heart is between lead one and lead ABF. So that's here, lead one, okay, and lead ABF. And again, some people can take ABL, but no, that's actually not the case. It's actually between lead one and lead ABF, okay? So that's for, for normal people, the axis of the heart should be here. So we always look at the direction, okay, of lead one and ABF. So is it positive or negative? And then again, ABF is it positive or negative? And that can tell us actually where the axis of the heart lies. So we only, so to be more practical, we only look at these two leads instead of looking at every single one and calculating all of their forces. No, we don't do that. We look at the two major leads, which is one, uh, one and ABF, and we see whether they are positive or negative. Okay. For example, if lead one is is this is positive. If it is negative in the opposite direction then it's gonna shift the axis from this area all the way to the opposite direction, okay? Let's see how does that translate practically. So we look at an ACG, we look at lead one, and we look at lead uh, AB. Why is it lead one, not lead two? So in many, in many physiology textbook, the normal axis of the heart is actually between zero and 90, okay? And in some, it, they, say, they tell you that between zero and negative 30, we call it a physiological left axis, which means that it's okay to have it. Okay, uh, so for this method, for this method, for the quadrant methods, some people actually consider even another lead, which is the number two. Okay, so if you want to go into details, some people even consider lead number two, okay, in, 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 in determining whether some people have a normal axis or a left axis or a physiological left axis. Okay, but for the sake of pure simplicity, just take lead one and ABF. And then in third year, you are gonna add, you're gonna probably add lead two to the, uh, to the methods, okay, so that you can get more accurate results, okay? But for now, we just take this one. And if we stick to this method, we're gonna like get our access correct like in the, in the majority of times, okay? So we don't need to go into details beyond that. So uh, when we look at lead one and ABF, if both of them are positive, so this is positive, this is positive, then we know that the, the axis is in the normal area, okay? So we look at them, what the positive uh, axis means, it means that the QRS, the, major, the majority of the QRS is above the, the, the line of the ECG, okay? So this is what we call a positive wave, for, while this, for example, is a negative QRX, okay? So for, for a normal axis, you need to have a positive 
and a positive ABF. If both of them are positive, that's a normal axis, okay? That's between zero and positive 90, okay? Now, for a right axis deviation, uh, for a right axis deviation, you need lead one to be negative, okay? Or lead ABF to be positive, okay? So if lead one is negative, then you are in this direction. And if lead AVF is positive, then you are in this direction again. And so your axis will be in this area, which is the right axis deviation in all of this area, okay? The entire of this area, which is a right axis deviation as we explained on this slide. So this is the right axis deviation area. Okay, and then in left axis deviation, again, lead one is positive, so it's in this direction, okay, and lead ABF is negative, so now this time it is in this direction, so between this and that, okay, we'll get our left axis deviation, which is in this area. Again, as I explained to you, sometimes we consider this a physiological left axis, okay, but now for simplicity, we'll call this the left axis area or the left axis deviation. Now, to make it simpler even, how can we memorize these things? Well, they're actually a mnemonic, okay, that can help you with that. So for right axis deviation, you can see that the QRS of lead one and lead ABF are pointing to each other. So lead one is down there and lead ABF is like that. So these people, this people, this person and this person are right for each other and they're gonna marry each other, okay? So they are right for each other and that's the right axis deviation. While for left axis deviation, lead one is positive, so it's upward, while lead ABF is negative, so it's downward. So these people are actually not right for each other. They are left, they left each other. Okay, they are not gonna marry. Okay, so they left each other, and that's what we call a left axis deviation. While the normal leads is both of them are positive. So that can make your life a bit either easier and so that's the practical method again of determining the, the axis of the heart in a matter of seconds when you look at ECG. Now let's look, uh, so for these, these are examples. So who can tell me what is the axis of this ECG? Uh, right axis? Exactly, mm, no, again. Normal. Normal. Yeah, that's normal because both of the leads one and lead ABF are positive, which translate to the first case, okay, when both of them are positive, then we are in this quadrant, okay, which is, uh, a, which is a normal axis, okay? So both of them are positive, both of them are above the electrical line of the ECG, and that's, this is a normal axis. Now, this is another one. Where's the axis of this ECG? Left. Yeah, it's so the extreme deviation. Yeah. Exactly, no, that's not an extreme deviation. Actually, for it to be an extreme deviation, usually AVR will be reversed, okay? So AVR will be pure positive. That's, uh, but that's like something, this is when Safwan, when someone asks Safwan, you know, what will, you know, what are conditions in which AVR can be positive? So this is the extreme axis deviation, okay? But this is normal, this is a normal left axis deviation, okay? Lead one is above, Okay, and lead uh, ABF is below. Okay, so they are they left they are in opposite direction and they left each other and that's a left axis deviation. Okay, now this is the third one. So what is the axis of this ECG? Right. Yeah, exactly. So that's the right axis deviation because this QRS is pointing downward, this one is pointing upward. So these leads are right for each other and this is a right axis deviation. Okay, now I'll touch a little bit upon these other two methods because as I said, they are useless, but you need to know them for the sake of exams. So for example, if they brought you this picture and then they told you from this picture, what is the axis, then you should know how to interpret it. So this method, which is a semi-quantitative method, you actually need to take, like it's called semi-quantitative because you need to take half of the leads, which are the limb lead and the augmented leads. And then you need to know where each one is actually, uh, like you need to represent the electricity of each one. And then you need to see where is the summation of all electricity and that will be the axis of the heart. So you start, for example, with lead one. Okay, it is positive. So you go for, this is lead one. Okay, and this is the, when we have an arrow, then that means that it's the positive direction. So this is the positive direction of lead one, okay. And then we need to, to draw three small, uh, three small lines, okay, uh, above and below it, okay. So we'll draw this one like this, and then we will draw this one like this, okay. And we will repeat this method for every single lead. So for lead two, for example, again, it's a positive lead. So we'll go for lead number two, which is this one in the positive direction. And then we will draw, we'll put the dots here, and then we will draw three lines above it and three lines below it. 
okay? Because that it's kind of, we're saying that this is, okay, the average electricity of this lead two is going in that area. Okay, that's why we're drawing three above and three below. Okay, it's just the physiological method. And then lead three, again, it is positive. Okay, so we go to the positive direction. Okay, this is lead three. And then again, we'll draw three lines above and three lines below. And we'll continue the same, the same method with ABR, ABL, and ABF as well. Okay, and then after that, we will look at our graph and then we'll say, okay, where are most lines? Okay, we can, we can count these lines. So we'll see, we'll say, where are most of these lines uh, overlapping? Okay, which is very clearly that it is in this area. Okay, and so we can say that this person's axis is almost between positive 90 and positive 60, which is the normal, because the normal axis is between zero to positive 90 or between even negative 30 to positive 90. So this person's axis is normal. Okay, so that's the method. That's the, the second method of calculating the axis. And then the third method is the net, is the net, zero, uh, net zero lead method. And in this method, we will try, we look at these six leads, okay? The limb and the augmented lead. And then we will say, okay, which one has, uh, has the most in, in net zero lead? Okay, and net zero means that the up area, okay, or the positive area is e almost equal to the down area. Now that might not always be possible. And so this method might not always be used at all times, but when we have such a lead, okay, where the positive, uh, the positive area upward is equal to the downward area, okay, in a single QRX, then we can use this lead and we call it the net zero lead. Okay. And we will, in this case, for example, it's lead number three. So we'll go to lead number three here. Okay. Which is this one. Okay. And then we will draw a perpendicular line to it. And that will be in our case, then we would have the ABR. Okay, and so once we know that we are dealing with the ABR, we again go back to the ABR at the ECG and we look where is the direction of the ABR. So it is negative in this area. Okay, in this example, it is negative. So ABR, uh, we know that if we have an arrow, then it's a positive direction. So we go to the opposite direction of the positive because it's a negative direction for ABR. So we're going to have the axis of the person here, okay, which is in the negative direction, and that's a normal axis access again because it's between zero and positive 90. Okay, again, these are literally so low yield. Okay, so they are not very important, but if you've got a question about them in the exam, then you should be able to answer it. I'll see if there are any questions before we proceed. Yeah, and it's not called an isoelectric lead, it's called a net zero lead. So yeah, you need to have at least one in order for this method to work. Otherwise, you can use the other first two methods, okay? And the first one, I think it's the best for everyone. Okay. So this is a recap of everything that we said so far. So we talked about calculating the heart rate, just as a quick recap. Okay, so the heart rate, either you go for 0 0.02 multiplied by the number of small boxes between RR, uh, between RR interval, or you go for 300 divided by the number of big boxes, and both of these will give you uh, the estimation of the heart rate. Okay, and then we talked about the axis of the heart, and we, I think it's better for you to depend on this method. So the normal axis, both leads will be positive. In right axis, the leads will be right for each other. So one will go down and one will go up. And then in left axis deviation, uh, the lead will be one positive and the other negative, and they'll be in opposite direction or they will leave each other. And that's what we call left axis deviation. That's a summary of everything that we talked about so far, okay? So that's a checkpoint. Can you determine the heart rate and the axis of this ECG? Is it normal axis? Uh, so this ECG, you need to look at lead one and you need to look at lead ABF. One is positive, okay. Oh, it's and positive. ABF is negative. So they are in opposite direction. They left each other, and this is a left axis deviation. If it would, if it was a normal, if it would it to be a normal axis, then the ABF should be positive as well. Okay, 
And then for the heart rate, so we calculate the number of big boxes, okay? So this is one big box, two big boxes, and three big boxes between RR interval. Then we divide 300 by three, and that's almost 100, okay? So the heart rate of this ECG is almost 100. If you want to be more accurate, then you need to calculate the number of small boxes and then multiply by 0 0.02, okay? And But it will give you exactly 300 because I can see that this is exactly 15 small boxes, okay? Between an RR interval. So now I'll see if there is any question. Yeah, that's okay. I didn't see your answer. Yeah, that's correct, Osama. So it's 100 beats per minute and it's a left axis, exactly. So now we'll talk about the irregularities on ECG. Uh, first, we'll start with the normal ECG, which is the normal sinus rhythm. So whenever you are faced with an ECG, as we said, first we go about the heart, we need to talk about the heart rate, and then the rhythm, the regularity, the intervals, the axis, and then if there are any major, uh, many, any major changes that can be spotted from the ECG. So for a normal sinus rhythm, that's the normal rhythm of the heart, this happens or we get this graph when the normal SA node beats and it, the, 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 the the electricity will be conducted through the normal conduction system of the heart from the atria to the ventricles to the AV node to the his and then to the Purkinje system all the way. If we have everything working very fine, which is the case in most of, in all of us, hopefully, and then we will get a normal sinus rhythm. And this is what we'd like to see in our patients. OK, so a normal sinus rhythm is actually when you have a one. First of all, if you calculate the heart rate, OK, it's going to be almost, so let's calculate the big boxes, almost one, two, three, let's say it's four, it's a bit less than four, so it's around 75, or it's 83, if you want to be accurate exactly, okay, so that, this is actually a good example of how I said, you no, know, the number of big boxes actually give you an estimation, so for example, I estimated that this is not included, and this is not included, and it gave me a bit a wrong answer, okay, it's not exactly 75, it's actually 83, well, if you went by the small boxes method and you multiply 0 0.02 multiplied by small boxes, then you will get exactly 83, okay? So that's why um, I said no. Yeah. Isn't it small box 0 0.04 multiply the number of boxes? Exactly. And in this case, I can see that we have uh, almost 18 small boxes. So I'll multiply by 0 0.04. Yeah. So okay. 18 multiplied by 0 0.04. So I got 72, let me check. So yeah, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. So we go for 18, uh, multiply by 0 0.04, and and then the number that you get, you need to divide it by you need to divide sixty by that number. By sixty, yeah, because it's per minute. Yeah, exactly. So that's why I just messed up. So it's eighty multiplied by zero point zero four. You're gonna get zero point seventy two, and then sixty divided by zero point seventy two. So you get eighty three exactly. Okay. So after you calculate the heart rate, then you look at the intervals. Okay, the PR is three to five small boxes. The QRX is less than three boxes. And then the QT interval is less than two big boxes. And then you look at the entire rhythm and you see that it is regular, which means that the RR intervals are happening at, at constant interval. Okay, so that's what we call a regular rhythm. We have a slide about it at the very end. And then uh, you, if we have a 12 lead ECG, we can also determine the axis, but of course you cannot from a single lead. And we even don't know which lead is this one, okay? So after you do all of this methodology, then you can determine that this is a normal sinus rhythm because we have P waves that are preceding every QRX complex. This is very important. That's what defines a normal sinus rhythm. So a single P wave is followed by a QRX is followed by a T, okay? That's a normal sinus rhythm. The ratio is one to one, which means that each P wave is followed by a QRS, okay? And then uh, all the PR and the QRS and the QT interval, everything is in their normal intervals. And finally, the heart rate is between 60 and 99, okay? When we have all of these conditions met, this is what we call a normal sinus rhythm. And you need to be careful actually about calculating the heart rate because sometimes uh, I'll show you the next example, which is sinus tachycardia and bradycardia. These are very obvious that this is a very fast heart rate and this is a very slow heart rate. Sometimes it can be very tricky, okay? So for example, the heart rate can be 105. Okay, so if you look at it without calculating the heart rate, you say, okay, this is normal sinus rhythm, but it's not, it's actually sinus tachycardia. 
Okay, so when you see a perfect P, Q, R, S, and T, okay, and they repeat every time, then just don't go and say it's a normal sinus rhythm before checking the heart rate. Okay, and that's why if you follow the methodology every time, then you will not end up messing up such a small mistakes. So if you want to talk about sinus tachycardia, it's exactly, no, it's, it's exactly a normal sinus rhythm. The same conditions apply. However, the heart rate is more than 100 beats per minute. And there are many conditions that can actually give us a sinus tachycardia. The most common one is exercise and then drinking coffee, uh, sometimes some medications. Uh, sometimes being in state of fear, danger, and so on. Anything that makes our heart beat faster is actually what we call as a sinus tachycardia, okay? So it is a sinus rhythm, but with a heart rate that is more than 100. And then a sinus bradycardia is the opposite, okay? It's a very slow heart rate. And it is when the heart, it's a normal sinus rhythm again, but the heart rate is less than 60. And again, there are many things that can give us a sinus bradycardia, usually anything that stimulates the vagal nerve, okay? So these are uh, some medications, okay? They can stimulate like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Sometimes we call them, uh, we call them the cholinergic medications, okay? And all of these medications that blocks the, the SA, that slows down the SA node can give us sinus bradycardia, okay? So this is sinus bradycardia. Again, it's usually benign and often seen. Sometimes we see it in highly trained athletes because athletes at a resting level, their heart is so big that actually if, he, if it beats at a rate, let's say of 50 or 55, then it's enough to get a supply for the entire body. While it works at a high rate, only when the person starts exercising. So it's a normal variant when we see it in highly trained athletes as well. And people who take beta blockers because beta blockers uh, decreases the rate of the SA node, okay? Uh, so that's everything that we explained. Next, we move on to the junctional rhythm. So let's say that for a reason or another, let's say someone got a scar in this area and now the SA node is not functioning, okay? Automatically, okay, the heart will escape. We call it an escape rhythm. So automatically the heart will escape the SA node and it will, it will start beating or it will start generating electrical impulses from the AV node, okay? And when it starts, okay, because the AV node is the junction between the atrium and the ventricle, then we call that a junctional rhythm. Okay, so because the, normally the SA node beats at a rate of 60 to 100, but the AV node beats at a much less rate, okay, it's between only 40 and 60 beats per minute. Okay, so in a junctional rhythm, we have certain few things. Number one, uh, the QRX complex is narrow, okay, it's not wide, it's less than three small boxes, because uh, still the, 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 the electricity is being generated from above the ventricles. We only get wide the QRX complex or more than three small boxes if the electricity is started to generate from below the AV node, like from the his or from the bundle or from the Purkinje system or whatsoever. Okay, now number two, the rate, as we said, is between 40 and 60. If we do a quick calculation here, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, actually. Uh, so that's a six small box of 300 divided by six is gonna give you a heart rate of 50. Okay, so the heart rate here is almost 50. And number three, the, a, the P wave is gonna be inverted in junctional rhythm. And that basically goes back to the concept that Safwan explained, because now the, the focus of the electricity in the heart is in this area, okay? And the depolarization is not happening from up to down, it's happening from down to up. And if someone, if a lead is capturing the electricity from this point of view, okay, then it's going to view as the electricity is going uh, far from it. And so thus it's going to give us a negative uh, deflection on the ECG wave. So in a junctional rhythm, we have a P wave that is inverted. We have a heart rate between 40 and 60, and we have the QRX are actually narrow. Okay. And that's a, that's a rhythm that is spaced by the AV node. And it happens when we have the S, when the SA node stops working for one reason or another. Okay, that's everything that we said. Next, we move on to the AV, uh, to the AV conduction block. Uh, there are three types of AV conduction block. Uh, we call it first, second, and third. To, keep, to give you a major idea in your mind, whenever you are lost, just go to these headlines, okay? First degree, just a rule of thumb, first degree, P wave is always conducted. Second degree, P wave is not always conducted. And third degree, there's a complete dissociation between the P and the QRS, okay? We'll explain on that further, but just keep, whenever you're lost between the types of AV conduction block, just remember these headlines, okay? To be called a second degree, then P wave must sometimes be, the, 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 P, the QRS is not always conducted after a P wave. To be called a first degree, then each P wave should be followed by a QRX complex and so on, okay? So these are like the definitions of the types of block. 
So let's start by talking about the first degree type. First of all, before we jump into further details, AV block happens when we have a pathology at the AV nodes that we know that normally the conduction is delayed by a certain amount of time at the AV node, right? Well, and for any uh, or medication, someone has a an MI, someone has a blood supply, when for any reason uh, a thing happened and it affects the AV node, then it will get dysfunctional, okay, and it will start uh, prolonging the time between the PR and the QRX complex, okay, so it's going to be a prolongation of time, and that will give us the types of heart block, okay, and to make it simpler, there's a very famous story, if you just go on the internet and type AV node block and the, the family history or whatever, you'll get this very famous story, Okay, in that story, we refer to as, we refer to the P wave as the wife and the QRS complex as the husband and the pacer of the heart that we insert as cardiologists as the counseling or the counselor that's gonna resolve this family crisis. So this family is actually having some issues or some crisis, and then which represents actually the AV nodal blockage of the heart. We will talk about it, each part of the story right now. So in first degree AV block, okay, the AV node is only slightly dysfunctional, okay? The PR interval, instead of being three to five small boxes or 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, it's actually, is this time the PR interval is gonna exceed 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.2 second, which is five small boxes or one big box, okay? So whenever the PR interval, so this is one big box, okay? And you can see that the PR interval is almost one and a half big box or almost eight small boxes, Okay, eight small boxes, which is 0 0.32 seconds. So because it's higher than 0, 0 0.2 seconds or higher than five small boxes, then we call this first degree block. And remember, by definition, every P wave, every P wave is followed by a QRX. There shouldn't be any dropped waves, okay? There shouldn't be any P that is not followed by a QRX. That's by definition, okay? The only problem is that the P wave this time, it, the PR interval got a bit prolonged and it's constantly prolonged throughout the entire ECG. So if we look at our story, in a normal sinus rhythm, the wife, which is the P wave, will, is gonna wait at home for her husband, which is the QRS complex. And the husband, which is the QRS, will come home on, on time every night, okay? So this is when we have a normal sinus rhythm. The P wave is followed by a QRS at a certain interval, which is the PR interval. In first degree AV block, the P wave, which is the wife, is waiting at home. The husband, the QRS complex, will come home late every night. So that's the prolongation of the PR interval. But he always comes home. And that's the definition of the first degree block. Okay, it's always conducted. So he always comes home and it's always at the same time every night. Okay, so the PR interval is always constantly prolonged by the same amount. Okay, so now if we look at the second degree AV block, uh, in this in this area, now the AV node is more dysfunctional, and then we further classify this. By definition, the second degree AV block is that not all atrial impulses are transmitted through the AV node. That's by definition. Now we further classify this into two types, either either Mobitz type one or Mobitz type two. And Mobitz type one happens when the dysfunction is at the AV node, and Mobitz type two happens is when the dysfunction is at the at the bundle of his. Okay. So we'll, we'll talk about them in more details right now. Okay, so again, by the, so Mobitz type one is when the PR interval constantly gets prolonged. Okay, so this time it's only these, okay, almost five small boxes, and then it gets prolonged up to six small boxes, and then here it's almost seven small boxes. And then at a certain point, it gets so prolonged that the next P wave has no QRX that is transmitted. Uh, the PR is going to be so long that the, PR, that the AV node will not be able to conduct the next QRX and it's going to just drop the speed, okay? Now, the features of the second degree AV block is that it's an irregular rhythm, okay? Because you can see that here it's regular and then suddenly there's a drop speed. So overall, it's not regular, okay? Sometimes we call it that we have a ratio. So for example, here we have four uh, P waves for every three QRX that is uh, conducted. So we write this as four uh, to three. That's the ratio of the block. Okay, and, num and number three, as we said, is that we must have some uh, QRX that are dropped, okay? And that's the definition of second degree block, whether it is type one or type two. If we look at our story, uh, so the wife, the P wave is waiting at home. The husband QRS comes home later and later every night. Okay, so that's the PR interval prolonging each time until one night he doesn't come at all, uh, to home at all. Okay, so that's the dropped QRS complex. Um, let's see if we have any question. 
So that's a previous question. How can I differentiate between sinus bradycardia and junctional rhythm? So sinus bradycardia is PQRST, but the heart rate is less than 60. In junctional rhythm, okay, most important is that you have, uh, first you have no P wave. The P waves are actually inverted. And that's what differentiates the sinus rhythm from any rhythm in the heart. Okay, in a sinus rhythm, you must have the P wave that is positive, at least in certain leads, which mainly are lead two and some other leads. In junctional rhythms, okay, or any rhythm that start from below, the P wave will be inverted or sometimes it will not be conducted at all, like in atrial fibrillation that we will talk about later. Okay, now let's move back to our topic. So now in Mobitz type two, uh, in Mobitz type two, so again, by definition, it's a second degree AV block. So the, so the QRS are not always conducted. Okay, and in this, uh, in this type of block, uh, the PR is actually constant, okay, it's not creating any troubles until out of a sudden and without any warning, a single QRS is dropped, okay, and because of that, because there is no warning, okay, we don't know that the beat is actually being dropped at this moment, uh, this type, this type of block is where, uh, is where things get serious and when the person needs a cardiology evaluation and he eventually ends up with a pacemaker being placed. Okay, because now this is this is actually a big pathology. So up to more, up to first degree, uh, up to second degree type one, we can consider it a benign. Okay, and we usually only follow up patients. But when we reach second degree type two, now this is where it becomes dangerous. Someone can have a cardiac arrest because of that. Someone can have an arrhythmia, and we need to have a pacemaker because we cannot determine at what time the the, the beat will be dropped. Okay, it's out of a sudden. And because also the pathology now is below the AV node, okay? And that's why you actually start seeing the QRX being a bit wider, okay? So they are not like these QRX, which are extremely narrow, but rather you can see that here the QRX actually gets start to get wider, okay? In this case, it's almost three and a half or four small boxes still, but it's still a wide QRX complex, okay? Because the, the conduction started from below the AV node. So back to our story, in second type, degree type two, the wife is waiting at home. Sometimes the husband comes home and sometimes he doesn't and out of no, out of no warning. But when he comes home, it's always at the same time, which means that when the QRS is conducted, then the PR interval is always constant. It's not prolonging like first degree type one. Finally, we look at the third degree AP block. This is when we have a complete block at the AV node, no electricity passes whatsoever between the atria and the ventricle. And so the atria will start contracting by itself and the ventricle will start contracting by itself. And that's the worst type of heart block. And the person must have a pacemaker at this, po at this point of time. Okay, so we look at the P waves. Okay, they will be uh, conducting at bet a rate between 60 to 100, which is the normal sinus rhythm. And then on another different world, the the, ben, uh, the QRS complexes will be conducted at a, at a, at, an, uh, at a ventricular rate at a ventricular rate, which is around 40 beats per minute. Okay, and if it is conducted by the Purkinje system, it's going to be anywhere between 20 to 40. Okay, so these two rhythms they are conducting completely separately, but we put them on the same line, and that's what produces a third degree AB block. Okay. So this time, uh, the wife, the P wave is no longer waiting at home. She and her husband, which is the QRS, are now on both on separate schedule. They have no relationship and they are no longer talking. Okay, each spouse has a regular individual schedule. They are completely separated. The freq this frequently requires counseling, which what we said is a pacemaker in the form of a temporary or permanent pacemaker. Okay, so this is a very, this is a bit an advanced trick, but I thought you, know, you might benefit from it. Sometimes Mobitz type one, okay, which is when the PR interval gets prolonged until a beat is dropped and third degree AV blocks, sometimes they can get really confusing sometimes. Okay, so you, you look at the ECG and then you will not know is this Mobitz type one or is this third degree AV block. There is one way to differentiate between them. These examples are actually like quite distinct. Like it's very clear that this is a third degree block and this is a Mobitz type one. However, and at one point it can be really confusing. So if it happens to you that you're not sure whether you should pick a Mobitz type one or a second degree type one or a third degree, then you look at one thing, which is the regularity of the rhythm. So in third degree heart block, the rhythm is always regular, okay? Because the RR intervals are being conducted by the Purkinje system and they are always at rate between 20 to 40 and they are always regular. So the, 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 the length is constant between them. While in Mobitz type one, the rhythm is irregular, okay? So you have three, two beats here, okay? That are almost of similar length, okay? Well, this one is a bit longer. And then you have a drop beat, so a very long area, okay? So when you have irregular rhythm, it's Mobitz type one. When you have a regular rhythm, it's third degree heart block. 
This is a bit advanced, but I thought you might benefit from it. Okay, let's see if we have any questions. So what does the ratio mean? So the ratio means, uh, so the ratio means, for example, in that we talked about the ratio, let's talk about it here. So it means for how many, for how many QRS conducted, how many QRS are conducted for every P wave. So in this example, let's say if we have, if here we have a dropped beat, okay, then this is the first P wave after the drop beat, and this is the second, and this is the third, and this is the fourth. So it's four, okay, four P wave, and then that's to a ratio of how many QRS complexes, one, two, three. Okay, so we have, it means that we have four P waves uh, for each three QRS complexes, okay? Sometimes the ratio is fixed, okay? And that's especially in second degree type two, we call it a conduction that is two to one. So it means that for every two P waves, one QRS is conducted, okay? So that's a severe four, for example, okay? So sometimes we can have fixed ratios, okay? And just a clinical term that can help us differentiate between different patients. All right, and now we move on to the long QT syndrome. Uh, all you need, all what you need to to know about this syndrome is to recognize it. Okay, it's basically when the when the when the QT interval from the beginning of the Q wave to the end of the T wave, someone it exceeds. Ask, someone sorry. is asking to repeat the third one, to the third block. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, okay. So this is the third type. The, the electricity is not being transported whatsoever between the atria and the ventricles. Each one has a separate schedule. Each one is working on its own, okay? So you can actually separate this line into two lines, okay? One is the P waves, which are working by themselves, okay? And they are being conducted at the rate of a sinus rate, which is between 60 and 100, okay? So you can see the P wave is conducted and then another P wave and then another P wave. Okay, if you calculate the rates came to be between 60 and 100, and then on a completely different world, not related to them at all, are the R waves, okay, or the QRS complexes, uh, because uh, these QRS complexes are being uh, generated from the ventricles, and they have no relation to the atria whatsoever. So they have no relation to the P waves whatsoever, okay? So the QRS complexes uh, will be conducted at a ventricular rate because they are generated from the ventricles, and the normal ventricular rate is only between 20 and 40, okay? So because the ventricles is not receiving any signal from the AB node and above, then it will start generate its own signals, but it can only do so at a maximum of 20 to 40. And so if you look at the RR, they're going to be regular, okay, but they're going to be like the distance between them is going to be very prolonged. So, for example, in this example, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, almost almost six and a half big boxes, okay. So that's going to be a very low rate. So that's the third degree, okay. It's characterized by P waves that are completely not related to the QRS complexes, okay. So here we have a P wave, a P wave, and then a sudden R wave. And then another P wave, another P wave, and then an R wave, and then P wave, P wave, and then R wave, and so on. Okay, so the rhythm is completely chaotic. You don't know what's happening because there are actually two separate rhythms that are put on the same line. So that's the third degree of heart block, and it's as we said, it's the most severe. The person requires a pacemaker. Okay. So let's go back to the QT syndrome. So for the QT syndrome, just you need to you need to recognize it. So when it is more than 400, we said that the normal QT interval is uh, is up to 400 milliseconds or two large boxes or 10 small, bo small boxes, okay? Now we consider it a long QT syndrome when, it, when that's, these are numbers that are fixed by cardiologists already. So when it is more than 450 milliseconds in men and more than 470 milliseconds in women, I don't know why do we allow for a slightly higher range in women, okay? But that, these are the numbers in which we consider it's a long QT syndrome. Uh, what is the benefit? Why do we need to know about this syndrome? First, because number one, uh, it is caused by certain ion channels, and I believe they are written in your lectures. They are related to sodium and potassium channels. Okay, so when we have defect in electricity, then we will have prolongation in, what does the QT represent? It represents ventricular repolarization. So because of abnormal ion channels, we have prolongation of ventricular repolarization. Now, the danger about this syndrome is that when it gets so prolonged, okay, like really, really prolonged, then we can we can get something called torsades to point, okay, which is a very fatal arrhythmias. Uh, I don't have a, pic, a picture of it right now, but it's when the when the arrhythmia becomes so chaotic, okay. It's a type of ventricular fibrillation. I'll show it. I'll show it to you in the next slide. 
but the idea is that this arrhythmia, if we get a so long QT, into, uh, QT syndrome, and then it's at one time the, the QT interval gets really prolonged, then we can switch to a fatal arrhythmia in a matter of seconds, and the person can die in a matter of seconds. And that's why, again, these people usually need an implanted pacemaker or need medication or cardiology follow-up and so on, okay? Now, long QT syndrome actually could be congenital. As we said, it's a defect you know, in one of the channels, or it could be acquired. And acquired QT syndromes actually happen because of medications. And there's a long list of medications that can produce a long QT syndrome. So usually when you combine many of these medications in a hospitalized patient, then you can get long QT syndrome and you need to watch out for this, okay? And that's everything. Uh, here, there's a formula. It's a bit advanced again. It tells you that, uh, okay, sometimes uh, you need to, well, sometimes when you, when the heart rate goes high, the QT interval by, yeah, by logic, it will get shorter, okay? Because you, you're now getting more beats in a single minute. Okay, so that's kind of an incorrect uh, size of the QT interval or an incorrect length of the QT interval. So to calculate, if you have a very fast heart rate and you need to calculate an accurate QT interval, not the one that you're seeing right now, but you want to calculate the one that will be that will be shown if the person was resting. Okay, then you use this formula, which is the QT right now at a fast heart rate divided by square root of the RR. Okay, so divided by square root of what's the RR interval, and then you'll get the uh, and then you'll get the the results of the of the of the actual QT. Okay, so for example, in this look at this example. So the QT interval is 18 small boxes, which is 0.72. Okay, and then the RR interval is 24 small boxes in this area. Okay, if you calculate between the RR, these are 24 small boxes or 0 0.96 seconds. And then it's square root of 0 0.96, you do the math. Okay, and you'll end up with a QT interval that is 0 0.73 seconds, which is very huge because this is almost, this means it's 730 milliseconds. Okay, and remember that we consider it long if it's more than 450 or more than 471. Okay. So this is the final type of arrhythmia that we'll talk about, which is fibrillation. Okay, so fibrillation happens when either the atria or the ventricles, depending on what we're talking about, the atria or the ventricles, when they don't contract. And we, we call it the fibrillate. And fibrillate in English means that if this is the atria, just do like this, okay? And you can see it if you are in, a hope, in an open heart surgery, and there are many videos on YouTube, okay, just write atrial fibrillation in open heart surgery, you will see that the atria or the ventricles are not contracting, but rather they are just doing like this. They're just kind of shivering, okay? That's what we call a fibrillation. Okay, and that's a fatal arrhythmia if it was ventricular. If it was atrial, it's not fatal, but it can lead to many complications. So an atrial fibrillation, so the atria, which is normally produces the P wave, is now fibrillating. So it's not contracting. So we don't have a P wave. Rather, we have some very small up and downs, up and downs that none of them actually are P wave, okay? So we call this a chaotic background, okay? So the background is very chaotic. It's up and down, up and down, but there are no discrete P waves. You can't tell me that this is a P wave or this is a P wave. No, none of them, okay? These are just small shiverings that are produced by the atrial muscles or the atrial cells that are producing these chaotic lines, okay? And it happens because actually, look at this picture, the atria, because at this point, okay, someone who is having atrial population actually have multiple points at which the electricity is being conducted. So it's not the SA node that is now generating the electricity, but rather multiple foci at the atria. Each one is generating a different electricity. And when all of them are combined together, it produces this type of rhythm. Okay. Now, now we have, okay, so we said that we have kind of, you can think about them as multiple, uh, multiple electrical nodes that are producing the electricity. So if we have an electricity from here, electricity from here, and so on and so on, all of these cells are producing different types of electricity, then the fastest one, the fastest one that reached to the AV node will be conducted to the ventricles, okay? And then another one, after like, after a couple of milliseconds, another one will reach the AV nodes, okay? But the process is so chaotic, okay? That this is someone, for example, the first uh, QRS, we got it from an electricity that started from here. And then the second one, we got it from an electricity that started from the way up. Okay, so the distance is different, the time is different, everything is chaotic, and that's why this translates on the ECG as if uh, the QRS complexes are conducted on a totally irregular pattern, okay? Because just to make it so simple, like whenever an electricity reaches the AV node, it will be conducted, unless the AV node is in the refractory period. Okay, and that's why it produces an irregularly irregular rhythm. Okay, it means that the rhythm is completely chaotic. It's not following any pattern whatsoever. 
Okay, so the definition of atrial fibrillation is that we have a chaotic background, there is no discrete P waves, and the QRS complexes are irregularly irregular. Okay, now let's now the same concept if it applies to the ventricles. Now the ventricles are huge muscles. Okay, so when they contract, they produce much like much more noticeable changes on the ECG. But again, they are not contracting. They are not producing discrete QRS complexes. They are just fibrillating or shivering. Okay, so when they shiver, they produce these chaotic lines again. When you find such a chaotic ECG, that's always a ventricular fibrillation, which is a fatal arrhythmia. Okay, the person can die in a matter of seconds. Okay. Uh, again, it's the same concept, but this time in the ventricles, there are multiple areas that are generating the electricity, which produces ventricular fibrillation. Okay, so these are the types of rhythm that we already covered, but now just I just grouped them in a single slide, which is when we talk about the regularity of the rhythm. Okay, uh, so it could be a regular, regular, regularly regular rhythm, which means that it is 100% discipline, this guy is really knowing what it's doing, okay? It's just that the RR intervals are always constant, okay? And this is what we see in a normal sinus rhythm, in a sinus bradycardia, in a sinus tachycardia, and even in a Mobitz type one, okay? So all of this will be a regularly regular rhythm because the RR interval are always constant whatsoever. Now, a regularly irregular rhythm, it means that the rhythm is irregular, Okay, but it's following still a certain pattern. And that's what we see. Oh, sorry, that's what we see in Mobitz type one. So Mobitz type one is here. Not, it's not a regularly regular rhythm, I'm sorry. Uh, so to explain that, so we know that in Mobitz type one, uh, here I meant to say a first degree AV block. So types of regularly regular rhythm, it is sinus rhythm, sinus bradycardia, sinus tachycardia, and first degree AV block. These are all regularly regular. Regularly irregular rhythm includes Mobitz type one. Okay, and so as we said, the, the RR intervals are not always constant. Okay, so you can see that this one is almost constant to this one, but then there is a huge space here. But still, the, the entire ECG is following a certain rhythm. We call this a grouping rhythm because you can see that these three are related to each other, and then these three are related to each other, and so on. Okay, so the RR intervals are irregular, but in, a, in, in an organized way, okay, in a grouped way. That's a regularly irregular rhythm. Now, the final type is that with the one that we just explained is atrial fibrillation, which is a completely irregular, irregular rhythm. So the rhythm is irregular and it's not following any pattern. And that's what we see in atrial fibrillation. Okay. I think we're done. So that's just the recap. Okay. And then I'll take the questions. Uh, so the recap of the heart blocks type, again, that's a normal sinus rhythm, P, Q, R, S, T, and all P waves are conducted. First degree heart block is when we have just a prolongation of the PR interval, but it's a constant prolongation. And by definition, all QRS complex are conducted. Okay, now I'm just going so fast because we already explained everything. Second degree type one, okay, is when you have a constant prolongation of the PR interval like this, and then it gets prolonged and then it gets prolonged until the next beat is dropped. Okay, second degree type two where things, these two require pacemakers, so things became, become much, much more serious. So in second degree type two, okay, the PR intervals is constant, constant until sudden out of nowhere, it's not conducted. Okay, and then the third degree heart block is where there's complete dissociations between the atria and the ventricles, okay? So the atrias are running at their own rhythm, okay? And then the, these are the, all the P waves of the atria, and then the, uh, the ventricles are running again at their own rhythm, and these wide, notice that they are very wide QRS complexes because they are from below the AV node. Okay, so they're being conducted at their own rhythm. Usually the atrial rhythm or the P waves are between 60 to 100 per minute and the ventricular rhythm is between 20 to 40 per minute. Okay. If we put everything that we talked about in a slide, now we should have a very clear methodology of interpreting an ECG. Whenever you hold an ECG paper, just go through everything that we did. At, at first, it's gonna take a lot of time, but then with practice, you're gonna do it in literally in less than a minute. And then after that, you don't, after when you become an expert, you don't even need to follow the methodology and you will be able to pick up all the abnormalities, even just like with, with a glance, okay? But it takes a lot of practice and it takes like up to like 50 or even higher to reach that level. Okay, so we, we talked about first you determine the rate and then the rhythm, is it regular or not? Are all P waves conducted or not? So by this you can determine if there's any heart block. And then you look at the old intervals. If the PR interval is prolonged, it would mean a type one first degree, type one block or type one AB block. And then you look at the QRS, it is wide or narrow. And then you look at the QT interval. So you look at all the intervals, okay? So after you finish the rate, the rhythm, the conduction, and then all the intervals, you look at the axis, 
Okay, so is it normal left or right by looking at lead one and ABF? And then after that, this is a bit advanced. We didn't talk about it. You can look at the hypertrophy, but we said actually that sometimes from axial deviation, we can interpret if there is hypertrophy or not. But there's a specific rule that I didn't go through because it's a bit advanced. And then Safwan talked about this, which are ischemia related changes. So if there's any ST segment elevation or depression, this is again, really advanced. We didn't talk about it. And if there are any T wave abnormalities, Okay, so sometimes the T wave gets really big and that can indicate any condition like hyperkalemia. Okay, so we have if we have a lot of potassium, the T wave can re get really big. Sometimes the T wave can get inverted in ischemic changes and there are many things that can happen to the T waves. Okay, we actually stopped at this point, which is more than enough because that's what's covered in your lecture. And the things, uh, the, the, the rest of the things, are, the rest of the objectives are actually so advanced. Before we go to the practice, do we have any questions? Yeah, uh, both type 1 and type 2 MOVITs will drop some QRS complexes because that's the definition of second degree AV block. It's where some QRS are conducted and some are not. That's the real definition. Any other questions? So I only have few practice here, okay, like only four. So what is the pattern of this ECG? Now, again, whenever you look at it, you need to look at it for, you need to check for the heart rate, for the intervals, for the regular rhythm and so on. But I just need like a spot on diagnosis. So what is the rhythm here? The thing is, I can't see the chat, I don't know why. So the rhythm here, okay, if you look at it, uh, it is it is actually a sinus rhythm because every, every P wave is followed by a QRS and then a T, okay. However, it's not, we don't call it a sinus rhythm because this is the pitfall that I, to, that I told you about. If you actually calculated the heart rate, this is gonna be sinus bradycardia. So these are one, two, three, four, five, six big boxes. 300 divided by six is gonna be 50. So the heart rate here is 50. So the final rhythm is gonna be sinus bradycardia. And that's why I told you, when you look at the perfect uh, sinus rhythm, don't say it's sinus before calculating the heart rate because it sometimes can get tricky. Okay. This is the second one. Yeah, it is 52, that's true. So when we look at the second one, so what we see here is a, com is a completely chaotic rhythm. Okay, and we said that we, we see this in one condition, which is atrial fibrillation. It is defined by uh, an irregularly irregular rhythm with a chaotic background, okay, and no discrete P wave. So we cannot identify any P waves. Okay, so that's atrial fibrillation. The third one, Okay, so I'm gonna just go, I'm just gonna go over them to be fast, two more are left. So if you look at this one, so we can see here that there is something that is not conducted. So we know that we're dealing with some types of heart block. So we need to know which type of heart block. Let's look at, so because some are not conducted, so this is second degree by definition. Now, is it type one or type two? We look at the PR interval. Okay, so it is, uh, it is constantly being prolonged until a beat is dropped. Again, here after the beat, it gets very narrow again, and then it gets larger and larger until another beat is dropped. So that's Mobitz type one. Because, because if it was Mobitz type two, then the PR interval should be constant until a sudden beat is dropped. So that's second degree type one or Mobitz type one, or we call it Winky Buck. Okay, the final rhythm here is a complete chaotic. There are no QRS and there are no discrete QRS waves and so on. The ventricles are just shivering and that's a ventricular fibrillation, which is the fatal arrhythmia that we talked about. And that's everything. Do you have any questions for me? So what happens if the, if the PQ segment, I think you mean the ST segment because that's what we call it. If the ST segment gets, gets depressed, uh, we call that condition an NSTEMI, okay, which is non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. Uh, this is the third year topic. Uh, it is actually when we have a, a heart attack, but not the, but the, 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 there is still some blood supply going on. If we have a complete heart attack and the blood supply is completely stopped, we get an ST elevation, and you'll get the physiology behind that in third year. 
but if the blood supply is still a little bit going on, okay, to the area, then we call it that an NSTEMI or non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, which is ST depression. Uh, the PQ interval. Uh, the PQ interval, if it gets depressed, that's a very rare condition, but it, it gets depressed uh, in, in pericarditis, okay, which is inflammation of the pericardium around the heart. Just go to Google and write pericarditis ECG. You'll find that uh, the, uh, the, PQ, uh, the PQ segment is actually all going down. You'll find them like, like sharply going down. Okay, if you, but that's extremely, I mean, that's very advanced. Any other question? So I really hope that you benefited from that. And uh, thank you very much for your attendance and for your time. If you have any question, by the way, you have my email and also I'll type my number here. Okay, so if you have any question, you can directly message me. Okay, you can take a screenshot for that because I'm gonna delete it. All right, thank you very much for your time. Assalamu alaikum.